All right, I'm back in plenary session, joined by two, by two economists, Christopher Whaley and Neeraj Sood. And they're the authors of a new paper entitled Back to School, the effect of school visits during COVID-19 on COVID-19 transmission. Gentlemen, Christopher and Neeraj, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, it's great to be here. So why don't I, you know, before we get started in this paper, and of course, you know, schools is all is it's the discussion that everyone wants to have. And I've been having it on this on this podcast for a while. But I wonder if you might tell listeners a little bit about, you know, what you do, where you are, what's your day job that brought you to this? So maybe we'll start with you, Christopher. Um, what do you do? I know you work for Rand and I know we have some mutual friends. Sure. Uh, so I'm a house economist at Rand. Most of my work has really been around looking at at large scale medical claims data and trying to see what's going on in terms of how how healthcare services are priced and how do different patients decide to use different types of healthcare services. Uh, And so during COVID, been able to to really, I think, use a lot of this existing data infrastructure and to look at, I think, some pretty novel things about the COVID pandemic. So for example, how people cut back on on care, what have been the the shifts to, to telemedicine, and then also what are some of the factors associated with COVID infections and COVID transmission. Okay, and all important questions. Neeraj, how about you? What's your day job and, and, and what do you do? I'm a professor of public policy at the University of Southern California. I'm also a health economist. I used to be at RAND, but moved to USC about 12, 13 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, my research is, you know, writ large, kind of pretty broad health policy research. I've done several papers uh, related to infectious diseases, trying to understand how uh, either public policy or new treatments or new things happening in that space, how they influence behavior, uh, what are optimal policies in this space. Uh, So I've been working with Chris on other healthcare related stuff. And when the pandemic hit, uh, we thought, you know, our access to this unique claims data uh, made us well poised to kind of pivot to uh, you know understanding what was happening with COVID, especially the public policy response to COVID. Yeah, it's terrific. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And um, you know, I want to I want to start by one thing that I, I'm going to put my two cents out there. You know, um, I don't know if you guys follow, but if you spend a lot of time online, you'll see that uh, economists have been getting a lashing. Um, by that I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're at a time that I think is quite unprecedented. Of course, not just the pandemic, but also the response to the pandemic. I mean, everything is unprecedented, uh, really. And uh, I've said repeatedly that I think uh, what you want in such situations where there are unprecedented trade-offs of large magnitude, you're making policy changes like this, you want all hands on deck. By that I mean, you want historians, you want medical doctors, you want epidemiologists, and you also want economists. Because one thing economists bring to the table is, I think, the, the rigorous application of methods to quantify trade-offs. Um, I think that's what economists do very well. Uh, in the meantime, I've heard a lot of pushback and some people say, why is an economist commenting on a trade-off? And I think to myself, well, that's what they like to do. I wonder, so I wonder what you all think. I mean, uh, surely you're biased, but, uh, but uh, you know, you, uh, surely you think economists have something to offer in the midst of a pandemic and so do other people. What are, what are your thoughts? I, you know, I think economists have a lot to offer and you're, you're dead right that economists think about two things all the time. One is trade-offs. Um, and so, you know, economists say there's no free lunch. Whenever you do something, there's got to be something else that kind of gets out of whack. So you need to kind of look at what's getting out of whack when you do something. And the other thing economists worry about a lot is incentives. And whenever you implement public policy or you think about behavior, people respond to incentives. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think economists you know, worry a lot about those two things and have a lot to contribute. And now you know, several economists are empirical economists. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they have uh, skills or tools to kind of analyze real world data and, and, and try to figure out what's happening in the real world. So I think those are kind of places where uh, economists uh, can contribute. How about you, Christopher? What do, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I think just kind of like a, an analogy that has driven a lot of my, my pre-COVID work has been looking at healthcare affordability. 
And so we, we can spend all of our money on healthcare and have the, the best healthcare system in the world, but we're not going to have any money to, to spend on other things like education. And so a lot of the, the work that, that I've done has really been trying to, to think about those trade-offs in terms of what, what's the optimal amount that we want to spend on, on healthcare uh, versus have for, for everything else in life. And so I, I think that exact type of trade-off that or mindset rather that, that economists like and, and thinking about trade-offs has been really important during the pandemic when we have lots of, of risks in some areas and, and the way in which we, we compensate for those risks or account for those risks might lead to, to other unintended consequences. And so I think uh, trying to, to balance the risks and, and the, uh, the consequences of, of, of balancing those risks has really been kind of a, a natural um, sort of thought process for, for that economist. But I, I think you're also absolutely right that this has just been an insane year. And so economists, I, I think, certainly can contribute to, to the discussion and to the, the policy debate. But it's really important that we have kind of all audiences and all perspectives in, in the boat as well. Yeah, it's well put. You know, and I guess my bias is, of course, I think that that's all true. Uh, the trade-offs, the incentives, I think they're important. I think they're important in all walks of life. We, we ignore them to our peril. If we ignore them, we make bad decisions. And I think the other thing that I think you all bring, uh, by you all, I mean economists, um, uh, in addition to other fields, of course, but I think you also focus on this, which is you really want to quantify phenomenon, quantify things. I always tell people, you know, when they pitch me some medical therapy that they think works, and sometimes I tell them that, you know, if you want to have some fun, you think something works, go ahead and just do a power calculation for what it would take to show that that works in a randomized setting. And what I find is when they actually get down and sit down and say, well, what do they think the effect size is? And they do that power calculation, they see the trial they need to run, then they start to reconsider what they mean by, quote, that works, you know? And at least they have some sense of what they think the magnitude of the effect is. And so I think that's important too, when we talk about some low frequency events, whether it's you know, the risk of CVT with a, with a vaccine, the risk of a, a kid spreading SARS-CoV-2. It's important to quantify what we think and put it in context of other risks we participate in on a daily basis. And so I think that's a, prem, a, a prelude to your paper. And I guess maybe Chris can walk us through some of this paper, but I think this is a very interesting paper. I mean, you know, you all are trying to answer one question in a broad policy question. I think the broad policy question is, um, you know, under what circumstances in the midst of this pandemic should we consider opening schools? Where in this spectrum are the risks and benefits of schools favor in-person education? And there are lots of parts that go into that. You know, we have to think about what is the educational difference in outcomes from in-person versus, uh, you know, remote learning. We have to think about what are the impacts on teachers and staff. We have to think about what is the impact on the kids themselves. Thankfully, uh, you know, for all the terrible things about SARS-CoV-2, the one perhaps saving grace is that it is far less lethal in children. I think you can actually say that these days. Uh, it, is, it is not as bad in kids as it is in older people. Um, so we have to think about the kids' health. And then we have to also think about you know, the mere factor having schools may have some impact on the spread of SARS-CoV-2 in that community. And there have been, I think, several sort of clever economic analyses. And yours is joining that group of sort of clever papers that try to answer this question. So I wonder, um, and by that, I mean the question of, if you open schools in person, what does that do to community spread? So I wonder if you might start, Chris, by talking about your data set, how you frame the question, how you think about the question, and, and sort of the methods that you approached it with in this paper. Sure. Uh, so I, I think that the framing is exactly right. And so that's kind of what we tried to contribute to, to this question, because we, we know that there are lots of concerns about in-person school and, and just the, the equity and kind of all the, the equity issues that go along with remote versus in-person learning. But at least when we were, we were working on the paper and starting to work on the paper, there really wasn't a clear sense of whether or not in-person school versus remote learning led to a differences in, in infection rates. And so what we did is, um, you know, it's looking at this question, I, I think is a, a bit of a challenging question to look at just because, um, or I guess for two reasons. So one, there's not lots of data on what schools are open versus not. Right. And then even if you know, like a, a school district has, has reopened, uh, public versus private schools within the same district may operate differently or some patient parents may opt out. And so it's hard to have a good sense of this district is, is totally open or, or not. And then at the, at the same time, it's also hard to look at COVID infections. And so uh, what we were able to do is, is use data from about 7 million people across the country and actually look at, at differences in COVID infection rates. And to look at, at school reopenings, we actually use a, a pretty uh, novel data set that's actually been used quite a bit to look at various COVID related studies. And if you have a, uh, a cell phone, uh, mm. it has a remote tracker, which, which mm. people maybe uh, 
not know about. Um, and a lot of studies have used mobile phone-based GPS tracking to actually say where are people actually physically going and in what do uh, mobility patterns look like in certain areas. And so we used a, a data set from about 45 million cell phones to actually track in, in which counties and weeks are people actually going back to school relative to the same rates where they went in 2019 prior to the pandemic. I see. Okay. So now it's getting quite clever. So I guess what you're saying is you do have a way to kind of benchmark it against full-time in person. And by that you mean, or at least going as frequently as you went pre-pandemic, because you're comparing it to, to how, how, how frequently you're going to that place. Um, so, so, that, so that gives you a sense that they're not just going on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they're going, you know, five days a week. Fair to say? That, that's right. So, so what we did is, is we said relative to the, uh, for a given county and a given week, what was the, the, uh, the foot traffic or the mobility to a given school in that county relative to mobility to that county in the same week? And so if, for example, the a school district is going half time in person and half remote, then we would count that as you're at 50% of where you were last year. Very clever. And then I guess the other corollary would be, and if, for instance, that school is reopened in a school hesitant zone and parents have brought their kids in 15%, you'll get 85% credit for school re quote, quote, reopening. Fair to say? Exactly. Okay. And then the, the outcome variable you're looking at is also quite clever. I mean, you're not just looking at, I mean, of course, there are some, you know, sort of observational studies where people look at the number of cases attributable to that particular school using contact tracing, using sort of that variable, but you're actually looking at spread in that community. And you know, talk a little bit about how you're documenting your outcome variable. I think that's also elegant. Yeah. So, so what we're, we're doing is saying for, for every household, what is the, the likelihood that a member of that household has a, a COVID-19 infection? And so these are, are patients who, who go to the hospital with a doctor for COVID and are actually diagnosed as having COVID. And then as a, a secondary set of outcomes, we also look at hospitalizations. And so do you actually go to the hospital or a member of your household go to the hospital for, for COVID? And we also look at COVID-related medical spending. I see. But um, the households, are those necessarily the households where the child is going to school or could it be any household in the community? even if they didn't have a kid in that household. Yeah, so, so that's a, a, I think a second point on why looking at, at the, the effect of, of school reopenings is a bit of a challenge. And so our, our outcome variable is actually specific to a given household. Oh, wow. One of the, the challenges of, e even if we had kind of perfect data on, on school reopenings, is that the reason that schools might reopen in one area versus another is that it might be safer or there might be different trajectories of the pandemic. And so if we just to say, you know, one area reopens school versus not, then that's probably a misleading comparison. And so what we did, it was we actually used the household data and we can say which households have children versus not who are, who are school age under the hypothesis that, that households with school age children are probably more likely to be exposed to school-based infection scenarios where there are more visits to schools relative to 2019. And then so we can do that, that comparison and essentially compare areas that have, have uh, reopened schools is, is measured through our school mobility versus households with and without children. Oh, I see. Very clever. Okay. Okay. So I'm getting a sense of it. So you're looking at um, if, uh, uh, if, if you're in a region where the kids open schools and you have the household where your kid is going to school, what's your increased probability of having a SARS-CoV-2 diagnosis than somebody in a household next door to you? Same sort of populate, same stuff going on in the community, but you don't have the kid going to school. Exactly. So exactly. Okay. Yep. And, 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 and is it fair to say um, that, uh, and, and the diagnosis is made through medical diagnoses. So these are, uh, uh, these are actually, um, uh, uh, what's the, where, where do you get the variable that they've been diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, from, yeah. Yeah, so, so in our other work uh, that the Neerja and I have done, and also, um, you know, both prior to the pandemic and related to the pandemic, we view this data from a company called Castlight Health, mm -hmm. which basically aggregates uh, claims data from about 200 different employers across the country. And so we, we have this, this data set of about 7 million people with employer-sponsored insurance. And so can actually see in, in that data in a uh, pretty close to real-time basis who has as a COVID diagnosis versus doesn't. I see. And uh, I guess think about this is just that, you know, every time you have a COVID test, someone's billing your insurer for it. <laughs> and <laughs> we get to see that bill. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. So I guess you can also ask the question of whether or not if they have a kid going to school, are they being tested more, even apart from the question of whether or not they're diagnosed more? Yes, we could yeah. the testing rates uh, also. Okay. Because every time there's a test performed, there will be a bill generated. 
Okay. Okay. And, and and that's actually why we looked at hospitalizations too. So one one potential concern is 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 a way to reopen schools. Schools are doing more testing, and so as part of doing that additional testing, we could just be capturing, say, asymptomatic cases that otherwise would have just gone undetected. Right. But when we look at hospitalization, so it's it's not like you're going to have a hospitalization that goes undetected or, right. or a COVID case that that requires a hospitalization go undetected. We we actually find uh, pretty similar patterns, although much lower in magnitude. Good point. And if I mean, if I, if I recall correctly, some of the, um, you know, there's a CDC study that looked at uh, in the fall counties that reopened colleges versus not, and they indeed found that the counties that reopened the in-person college had higher rates of, um, of, of uh, diagnoses of SARS-CoV-2. But one of the confounding variables, of course, is that when a college reopens, they do a lot of testing. So perhaps it's an artifact of the testing. And in fact, I think uh, Yu Yang Gu has sort of nicely shown that with even more follow-up, those kind of differences attenuate, and there never were those differences in hospitalization and deaths in those counties. Um, but that's a separate question. I guess to come to your question, the other thing I was thinking is, um, I've read some other studies that even asked us sort of even a, a, a question that comes before your question, which are, you know, which are the schools that are likely to open in person? And this analyzed several factors. And it, I think it made the argument that, um, of course, uh, uh, paradoxically, it wasn't linked to the local spread of SARS-CoV-2, wasn't linked to hospitalizations in the local area. It was linked to political voting patterns, the strength of the teachers union, um, that those were probably better predictors of whether or not the schools were in person. And of course, we know there's this huge chasm between what is happening in the public world and what's happening in the private world, where there's a lot more. Um, were you able to sort of look into those, or are you just familiar with that literature? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, th those are, are good considerations. We, we didn't look at those in our study, though. Okay. Fair enough. Okay, so why don't you walk us through the results? Um, yeah, so so what do you, I mean, yeah, what are you, what do you find in or maybe you want to walk through more of how you did it because it's quite clever, but uh, above my pay grade. <laughs> uh, <laughs> happy to, to hop into to the results. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so our, our main finding is that in, in schools that, that did reopen, we, we did find a, a increase in the likelihood of a household having a, a COVID infection for households with children versus those without children. Okay. Uh, how, however, the, the effect is, is maybe a little bit modest. And so if we look uh, across the board, uh, if you say move from the 25th to the 75th percentile of school reopenings in school or business to schools, then that's about a, a two or 3% increase in the likelihood that a household has a, a COVID diagnosis. I see. And is there a way, I mean, can you put that in raw numbers? So like, what is the risk in a household without a child? And what's the risk in a household with the child? Is there a, sense, a way of sense of that? Uh, that is what we could do. So for example, uh, among just, just across the board, there was about a, a nine uh, per 10,000 household rate of, of COVID infections. Okay. And in households with a, a child following a, a, a full kind of zero to 100% reopening in schools, there's about a 0.3 per 10,000 increase in, in the likelihood of infection. Okay. So if you do something like sending your kid to school, yes, the risk of infection for your family is going to increase from nine per ten thousand to nine point three per ten thousand. Yes, I, you, I so so I are think you change your behavior as a result of this information. No, I think it. The answer to that is no. I, and I think I think the answer to that is it's it it really captures the trade off well, which mm -hmm. is that. From the point of view of the parent in the household, I suspect, I don't know for sure, I suspect that what they, what they are thinking is there is a huge good for them uh, to ensure that their child is well-educated. There may be a good in terms of them, um, uh, uh, women or, or parents, um, women in particular, may be disproportionately suffering in the labor force, having a hard time doing work. Um, we've heard that sort of uh, from many people, and I think there's some data to suggest that. Um, and, and they probably are willing to, uh, 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 to change their behavior for some difference in spread. But if the answer is nine to 9.3, I think uh, that is uh, still extremely unlikely that you are, your household is going to come down with SARS-CoV-2. And the difference is uh, very, very small in comparison. I think it's important. Um, and it's a, an important finding, yeah. And I haven't yeah. done, you know, we haven't done the study where we've said, so forget educational outcomes. Yes. If you just focus on health, right? So the question is, if a child is at home, fine, we've protected the child from COVID, 
but we've exposed that child to anxiety, to depression, to other issues. Yes. So even like I had, I don't know the estimate from the literature, but I can just tell you anecdotally based on, you know, my peer group, those, those effects are huge. And, and so just based on health, it's not even a trade-off between health and education, right? Just based on health, uh, it's unclear whether this would be, you know, a good policy. I think there are a lot of people who, uh, they act as if the tra- it should go from nine and 10,000 to 900 and 10,000. I mean, that's okay. how they're acting. Their behavior would suggest that that's what they conceptualize the risk to be. And okay. I think when you go from nine and 10,000 to 9.3 and 10,000, I okay. think um, that uh, uh, fundamentally changes the calculus for okay. that toy type of argument. And, and I think that's another thing, you know, we talk about what in the beginning, what economists bring to this. I think people who think about this uh, in a non-quantitative way, uh, you can you know you can you can think the sky is falling, but when you start to quantify it and you see that magnitude of risk, I think I mean my intuition is that's an extremely tolerable risk for probably one of the greatest public goods we offer in this country, which is a public education. Um, and in fact, I think Chris looked at some of the literature on other risks for school-aged children, and I think what he found is that. Chris, maybe you want to talk about that. It's the same as the risk of a injury on a playground or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the, the, there was a paper uh, from a couple of years ago that looked at, at childhood risk from uh, going to the ER for a playground injury. So somebody falls off the, the swing set or the, the slide. Uh, and that was uh, 0.4 for 10,000. And so almost the, the exact same as what we're finding. I see. So if you'll take your kids so, to the so, playground, uh, you know, right. um, yeah. Um, right. It's interesting. And okay, now let's talk about talk speaking. about hospitalizations. Zero. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's, no. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, it, it, I, you know, one, one caveat on the uh, the the infection rates, and so we we did actually find uh, pretty big differences based on income, and so for the the highest income uh, counties, we we actually found no effect, and so maybe they're able to to implement better mitigation policies relative to, to lower income counties. Um, and we did also find differences based on, on the trajectory of the pandemic. And so for example, if you look at kind of uh, kind of community prevalence of COVID, we, we found uh, in areas where there's uh, in the bottom uh, uh, two quartiles of COVID prevalence that there's actually no infection risk. And so if there's no community prevalence, then, then there's no uh, you know, risk of or additional risk of, of going to, to school, and the really the, the effect is driven by the the counties at the top quartile of, of COVID prevalence, and so maybe you know that the the smarter policy would be to say, look, you know, in cases where the the outbreak is really bad, maybe we need to have remote learning, but when out the outbreaks at least in a community level under control, then maybe in person schooling is is not that risky. And can you quantify the quartile? I mean, so bottom two quartiles, do you have a sense of, you know, what is the transmission rates in those quartiles or how would you quantify that? Uh, so, so in the bottom two quartiles, we, we didn't find any transmission rate. I see, but what, I guess, where does the upper bound of a quartile in like number oh, of cases per 100,000? Yeah, uh, that, that, that's a, uh, I'd have to check that. Okay. that that's a, uh, a recent addition since we, we posted the paper. Okay, well, that would be, be interesting because I think, you know, I, I'd be interesting because I'm trying to benchmark these in my mind. You know, I know that, um, you know, for instance, that North Carolina study, I think it ran with, uh, you know, 40 cases per one, you know, 40 cases per 100,000 people or something like that per day, you know, sort of a brisk mm-hmm. thing. And there's a paper that came out, I think, in the Lancet, um, the Respiratory Lancet Journal, where they quantify UK school reopenings by the number of cases um, averaged over a seven day period per 100,000. And they have sort of a different um, right. you know, probability spread. But I mean, it'd be interesting to kind of put in comparison because my understanding is that in the peak of the pandemic in places like North Carolina, South Dakota, we're talking about spread like you, you know, like wildfire. And so really, you know, so that the upper quartile would be probably really high. Um, but it's well yeah. put. I mean, well, what, you're, what you're saying is that there is a threshold of community spread below which schools are not even associated with an increased case in that household, um, above which there is, and perhaps that's the trade-off part, but below which the trade-off is uh, really clear that it's absolutely um, no increased risk of, of, of household transmission from a child being in school. Um, talk about the hospitalizations, because I think that also tells an interesting story then. Yeah, so, so on the hospitalization side, we, we found a, uh, a 
a 3% relative rate of, of increase, uh, which is, uh, you know, small, or I, I think a small relative, but the, the absolute increase just because hospitalizations are, are even rarer than COVID was still mm-hmm. quite a bit lower. So there was also um, a small relative increase in hospitalizations. Right. No and so that, that was, uh, I, I think, instead of 0.3 per 10,000, 0.003 per 10,000. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Puts it in perspective. So that's 0.003 per 10,000. That's like three per 10 million uh, households, right? right? Yeah. Wow. Okay. So um, it's interesting because when I look through your paper, I mean, um, well, maybe we could talk, we could talk with uh, Dr. Sud a bit about the policy. I mean, uh, you know, I guess, I don't know if you know this. Uh, I've been, I, I, I think that, I, I mean, I think that one will go back and look at the history of this pandemic and there will be many uh, errors that were made. Uh, but if I have to pick what I think people will think of as sort of the greatest errors with the greatest downstream consequences, I think it'll be school closure for a long period of time when it wasn't necessary. Here in uh, San Francisco, we've had uh, you know about one year that we've kept kids out of school. And um, it, you know the New York, and I think there's a fundamentally a difference in availability. Like every day the New York Times tells you how many cases are there, how many hospitalizations, how many deaths, scary stuff. What they don't have is a counter showing how many missed cases of child abuse, how many kids losing grade levels, how many kids are never gonna graduate from high school, never go to college, never make more than their parents did. Um, and those things truly do matter. How much anxiety, depression. You know, I hear so many people talk about how um, suicides, are they going up? Are they not going up? Are they going up? Uh, saying saying that, uh, that things are go- okay because suicides aren't going up. It's like saying, you know, you're in a good relationship because there's not been a homicide yet. You know, it's not really, not really the benchmark of happy mental health. <laughs> there's not been a death yet. Okay. I mean, so well, I don't, I don't well, think, I think yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of suffering short of suicide and homicide. Um, so anyway, but I, but, but there is an increase. Well, in, on, go ahead. Oh yeah, and just to tie your, your San Francisco results in. I yeah. mean, this is an area where where COVID uh, community spread is is among the lowest in the country, and so mm-hmm. maybe this is actually one of the the safest areas in the country is to, to reopen schools. And yet, I think the one of the worst one of the worst outcomes. Um, yeah. And I think I yeah. agree with you, Vinay, that if you ask me, like, what's the biggest mistake? I would say exactly that you're right. That closing schools. Uh, for a long duration, you know, for a few weeks, it's sure. fine. But even in LA, schools have been closed for more than a year. Uh, that's going to, you know, have a huge consequence on the kids. And then the other thing is that school closures were sold as like, this is the safe thing to do. Right. Like, you know, this is, you're not taking a risk. Let's close the schools. You're taking a huge risk. Like you're exposing these kids intentionally to higher risk of child abuse, to higher risk of depression. So you can't even say like, this is the safe thing to do. It's not the safe thing to uh, do. The status quo was in some sense, the kids were in school. And if you're pulling them out, ethically, the burden is on you That's what I say. to show yeah. that the kids won't be harmed by that, right? Otherwise, it's a, it's, it's a very tough ethical question that you're saying, let's do harm to kids because it might you know, lower community spread. And I, I think the burden is on people who want to keep keep schools closed. I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that, um, you know, uh, many things are forgivable in the first four weeks when there's a lot of uncertainty. But when yeah. you're talking about, you know, by, by August, by September of 2020, the data we're in, you know, we had seen what Sweden did when they pushed ahead with schools. Not only do they keep the schools open, they had no masks, no distancing. So they're really giving you the worst case scenario and they're showing you rather, while some of the cities had some significant spread, including Stockholm. Um, and so that gave you sort of an upper bound. Um, I think, I, and I don't know if you follow this literature, but I mean, there's the huge literature on what is the impact on teachers. And, you know, I'm willing to concede that teachers are at some non- uh, some slightly higher risk than the average person. There's conflicting analyses. Some analyses have shown that there is no increased risk to teachers in places with mitigation. Others have shown, I think, we're talking about relative risks of 1.3, but we're talking about absolute risks, I think, very, very low. Um, you know, and 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 I want to say that those risks can be, I think, improved upon with some di- with some basic um, measures, um, and we can perhaps give a reprieve for some of the older teachers who are more vulnerable. Um, but those risks are not of an order of magnitude so great that it justifies school closure, in my opinion. And so by September, October, I think everything from that moment from the fall onward is sort of an unforgivable sin. Um, and you know, we we have not yet um, paid the check. 
you know, we've seen what COVID has done and someday that will, thankfully, I hope this year, I expect, will come to an end, uh, at least as in terms of a pandemic phase. Uh, they, I just suspect there'll also be considerable outbreaks in the winter year for the next few winters um, because that's just the nature of such thing. But, but I think the, the downsides of the policy in terms of children will take 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and there'll be all the domains we described. Um, you know, you talked about immediate health, you talk about career outcomes. There are also the domains that are, I think, to speak to your point about the ethics of the continued closure, which is the intervention. I think continued closure is the intervention. You have to prove to me it works. Um, but some of the sort of existential things it does is what does it do to the body politic, I wonder? You know, a citizenry where you, uh, uh, in a setting of sort of wealth inequality and increased fragmentation and polarization, and now on top of that, you have uh, instituted an unequal penalty on poorer people, on, uh, on people who are in certain communities. Uh, I think that may change politics fundamentally. Uh, it may change, um, you know, uh, the sort of, sort of fundamental stabilities of society in the long haul. Uh, it's hard, it's unforeseen consequences that may result. Um, but anyway, that's that's more speculative. So I wonder if you might come back to um, your paper. Your paper was retweeted by uh, uh, NBER, which is the, the place you've posted it. Um, one of the tweets said, um, this paper finds that keeping schools open did increase the spread of SARS-CoV-2, which technically is true. Uh, it didn't, the tweet didn't quite include all this nuance of the magnitude. And I saw all these people, you know, they they know that I'm sort of an outspoken critic of school closure. Uh, they kept tagging me in the tweet and said, see, you're wrong. I said, I was like, did you read the paper? I was like, it's not wrong. I was like, they're quantifying it and they're showing you that it is a very, very small difference. And that does not negate, uh, I think, the, the, the policy question. Um, Chris, any thoughts on this policy question? Uh, yeah, so, so I, I did see the just the, the back and forth on Twitter, and so that's always uh, interesting to, to see. Uh, you know, th this is a I think a really nuanced question, and in the paper we we tried to uh, address that that nuance as, as best as we could. Um, and uh, the I, I think that the main finding is that overall there are pretty modest risks and, and pretty uh, modest infection rates. And so it's kind of up to, to the broader policymaker community. And this is where we need not just economists, but uh, the, the variety of disciplines to say, are we comfortable with, with this type of risk? Uh, with, with the caveat being that the risk is, is, is much higher for lower income communities. And so maybe we need additional policies for, for lower income communities and in areas where we have high, high COVID prevalence. Uh, but it, no, I'm just curious. I mean, you, you know, you did a nice job of giving me the absolute risks in the in that for the average, but for the for the whole cohort. But what are the risks in those highest quartiles? Just to give some sort of sense. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so for, for example, in in the uh, the highest quartile, yeah. we find instead of uh, about a rather in in the areas where where COVID prevalence is highest, instead of a a three per ten thousand, we find. Uh, uh, or so rather instead of a 0.3 per 10,000, we find about a five per 10,000 increase in, in infections. And so, and so what's, maybe the, yeah, what's the baseline, from, the from, base rate? From, yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe this is going from you know, nine per 10,000 to, to 14 per 10,000. And see. so maybe maybe that's an area where you know, that, that is a bigger risk. And so maybe there's some times where, where maybe school closures are, are appropriate, but what it is, really but depends on- the, the base on, rate wouldn't be nine. The, the base rate has to be higher there. It must be like right. 10, yeah, right. Right, right. Yeah, so so th th that's kind of the, the rough uh, calculation. Okay. And I think the other thing is, you know, this paper is good for a historical mm -hmm. look at the effects of school closures or school reopening. It's not a good paper for looking at the effects of school closures and openings now, because when we did this paper, there were no vaccinations. Correct. It was zero vaccination. Correct. Yes. Now, nearly all teachers are vaccinated. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So this was the estimate you got with no vaccination. Correct. Um, and I think that's an important thing to kind of keep in mind that in that sense, this is like the upper bound of what you would ever find today, uh, given 90% of, of, or I don't know, nearly yes. all uh, teachers are vaccinated and, and, and almost 50% of adults. Yeah. The general population is vaccinated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it, now it, it just seems like you would have to come up with some really heroic logic to to argue for uh, school closures. 
<laughs> well, don't worry. They, they are doing so. I, I see that. I see their gears turning. Um, no, it's a terrific point. And, um, I don't know, I just I tell you a slide side rant. Um, you know, uh, in the last two weeks, we've had a lot of, uh, brouhaha about Johnson and Johnson, Johnson and Johnson vaccine for women, particularly under the age of 50 is linked to, um, this particular type of blood clot, a blood clot in the skull, uh, associated with platelet activation, something called CVT, cerebral venous thrombosis, plus like this vaccine induced thrombocytopenia and activated thrombosis, this kind of tough state. And um, I don't know, they, they first called a safety signal. They said they had like six cases in 7 million shots and everyone said one in a million, that's fine. Let's press on with the vaccination. Uh, then of course, you know, within a week we got a lot more data. We got like 13 cases. The de denominator is not 7 million because it affects this really, this subgroup of women. The denominator is closer to like 1.4 million. And now you're talking about rates, particularly in certain age groups where you're getting between one in 150K and one in 80K kind of rates of this bad outcome. And, you know, so I, I was involved in a lot of spirited debates about whether or not this ought to be, you know, continued, especially in the setting of two alternative vaccines that don't have this problem. And people kept quoting me, well, what would be the risk to this woman if she didn't get the vaccine and she were to walk around and she might get COVID and what are those risks and they quantify. But just as you're saying, they use data from the fall of last year. And I'm saying, but those base rates just aren't the case anymore. They're plummeting. You can look at the cases plummeting. And so the whole calculus around this and this age question, uh, it may tip. Um, similarly, I think you're making an astute point, which is that you are you, your, your study was done in the worst of times. Uh, it can only be better than that now. And so as we move into the fall, and as these last recalcitrant school districts come up with a myriad excuses to not reopen in person, I think we should remind them that this was the worst case outcome, and it's probably much better than that now, um, and that they probably ought to do that. Any additional thoughts on this? I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, I, I, I wasn't quick to the draw. I mean, I think in June and July of 2020, I didn't see the full picture. And then I think in August, I started reading a lot of the economics literature on what schools do. Uh, which, you know, I'm ignorant to because I'm a doctor and, you know, it's not outside of my purview. Um, uh, but then the more I read about the value of schools, and then I started looking at sort of the contract tracing studies and, um, and those, and, and, you know, I think it's clear, um, it's almost heretical to say, but it's clear that kids are, you know, if exposed to the same sort of circumstances, they're maybe half as likely to get it. They have lower sort of viral titers. They're less likely to spread it. Um, they're certainly less likely to fall severely ill. They're less likely to die, um, you know, and I think it's fundamentally a different disease in kids. Uh, school closure, it takes a lot from them. Uh, they sacrifice a lot. Uh, they don't necessarily benefit from that. That closure is theoretically benefiting others. And I think you're quantifying how much that theoretical benefit is much more, much smaller than I think people think. Um, and I think people, the reason people's brains don't work so well on this issue is our intuition around respiratory viruses is that kids spread it, we get it. Uh, that fundamentally may not be the case with this unique virus. And, and it's hard to break that sort of pattern. And then I think the other psychological bias is the bias that we don't see the downsides of closure yet. They're hidden from us particularly those of us who are well off. And so we will see it someday. I think 60 Minutes will do, you know, they'll have interview four kids who suffered unspeakably during closure. And I think just like I, I keep saying, it's like the Iraq war, public sentiment will flip on a dime and people will act as if they believed all along schools should be left open. Um, I think another well, issue or policy fight that's going to happen in the future is not like schools will be open, but under what kind of circumstances? Yeah. So are, should kids be wearing masks for how long? Should kids continue to social distance for how long? Should kids be in a pod for how long? That's not normal school, right? Like right. normal school is you can hang out, like you, you socialize, uh, you can see your friends smile, uh, all of those things. You go to different classes. You're not just with the same 10 kids the entire day. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be a fight about, you know, are we just keeping schools open or are we actually providing a good learning social environment for the kids? Right. I agree with you. And I think that, I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a sound world, you can answer some of these questions in one week. I mean, you can just randomize a bunch of school districts and you will, I, I strongly suspect you will find that many of these interventions don't offer much and they can be relaxed rather quickly. And in fact, you know, there is quasi experimental evidence on just one of those things, you know, three versus six feet, which was a big brouhaha. They forget that they pulled six feet out literally out of their ass. They just made that up one day. Uh, and then they found that three feet, there's no increased risk of anything. And then, but then some people fight it and they say, you know, the study lacked the power to detect it better benefit from six over three. And my point is that, um, 
you know, I mean, the absolute risks are, we're talking, I mean, even lower than the ones you found, you know, the absolute risks were super low in, in this study. This is, I think Emily Oster is one of the authors. Um, and, and I'm like, what do you want the power to find? You want the power to find a difference in one in a million, you know, like what, what are you powering it for? And I think, I mean, I think that's where the non-quantitative thinking eeps, you know, creeps in. Um, I think you're right. Um, I think the other thing this episode has shown, and I hate to say it, but, um, I mean, me personally, I think that my view of the role of teachers unions has changed. And I've talked to some political scientists who've studied unions and unions um, in this space, um, they clearly, I think in my mind, they do not operate with the best interests of what's best for children at heart. Um, and I think that in retrospect, they will be seen to have obstructed on a number of occasions, um, sensible ways to get back to school. And so I think it will, it may have ramifications for going forward, I suspect in five years, um, there will be more charter schools than ever before. Uh, the school landscape may fundamentally shift. Um, and that might be a good thing. That might have been an overdue thing. So I think that's another consequence of this. Well, and just one other thing to add is that, you know, is doing this paper, uh, we really read a lot of the literature from a variety of different disciplines on the benefits of in-person school. Yeah. And in-person school is, is uh, just overwhelmingly uh, more beneficial for low-income children and also their families. And so that that's a particularly vulnerable population who's been impacted uh, uh, quite a bit. Yeah, it's a terrific point. Um, we, um, I had, uh, we have an article about school hesitancy because I guess one of the things people say now is like, well, we'll open the school, but people don't want to come. And I was like, let's well, you just scare the crap out of everybody and now nobody wants to come. But so, I mean, you have to overcome school hesitancy, I think, as you have to overcome vaccine hesitancy. Uh, it is, a, it is a, an incorrect belief about the world and what's in the best interest of your kids and, and there should be outreach. Um, so, you know, um, well, I applaud you both for doing this important paper. I mean, I think it is super important and I, I expect and uh, it, that it'll be well published. Um, and I, I hope to see that. Um, the paper is right now, it's out on uh, NBER. It's a working paper, Back to School, The Effect of School Visits During COVID-19 on COVID-19 Transmission. Uh, very important and timely paper, very clever use of methods. Um, it's exactly what we needed. Um, and I appreciate you both for doing it. Uh, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Yeah. We thanks, enjoyed the uh, conversation. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure.